Welcome to the SEO.co Search Engine Optimization Podcast. Digital marketing essentials and next level tactics. From off-site and on-site optimization to persuasive selling and everything in between. You'll learn actionable tips on what it takes to outright and outrank your competition. Hi, this is Ryan and I'm your podcast host today. We'll be having Chris Liu here on from copy.ai. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thanks Ryan for having me. Of course. Well, we've been following you for a while now and wanted to get you on a podcast to discuss where copy.ai is going and where you see it going. We've seen some growth within uh, your different tweets online and just an upward uh, movement, especially with COVID-19 hitting, there's been some significant growth with people doing stuff online, uh, being able to grow their businesses, uh, because that's where everybody's hanging out is online. So if you could just tell me real quick, uh, your background and how you got into orchestrating this, this great software. Yeah, my co-founder and I, um, my co-founder, Paul Yakubian, he's the guy who tweets about our company. Um, and I have worked together for five years now. Um, and we were at the investment firm. However, what constantly fascinated us was entrepreneurship, specifically like, how do you start it? How do you find the creativity for it? How do you really push it to the limits? And we realized that's a very strong creative exercise. and when uh, we launched our own thing, we realized how much writing there was to be done. Um, it's unreal. Like everything, the mission statements, the landing pages, the initial emails, the launch posts, um, there is just so much writing to be done. And that was one of the hardest parts. Um, and then we realized that, you know, the world needs more entrepreneurship and COVID really helped accelerate that. And at the exact same time, a very powerful AI algorithm was released and we realized the AI algorithm is the first four ends, AI powered creativity. And so we decided, you know what, this needs to exist. We need to distribute this AI to the entire world to really improve entrepreneurship and our goal is to have an, a billion new entrepreneurs in the next decade. That's great. So with, with the creating the software, was it an iterative approach? Like, did you create a little tool? and then expand upon it? Or did you have the idea to uh, have it do what it does today? And where do you see the growth of that? Yeah, um, when we started, we were very focused on highly repeatable um, uh, writing processes. Uh, so in our eyes, that was like writing ads. So our first version of that tool only had like seven or eight tools. And it was around Facebook ads, Google ads, and Instagram uh, ads and captions. And then uh, what we realized is, well, that's actually a pretty small piece of the market. Um, a lot of the small businesses, they don't actually even run ads, uh, but instead what they really need help on are product descriptions, blogs, blog intros. And uh, that's when we started expanding the scope. Today, we are aiming to build out tools for almost every single use case you can imagine. And the reason is, when we build out a new tool, we really want to help empower people uh, for a specific problem that they have. So for SEO, for example, coming up with ideas to write about, to coming up with that first intro, that hook, I have to really continue, keep someone continued reading. Um, we think that those are really, really hard problems and can be mentally tired. Um, and so we're trying to build out as many tools as we can to help facilitate that creativity. That's great. So with, with this technology, I know if it's built off of open dot, uh, AI and they use a technology called, uh, GPT three or GPT four, I think is GTP four is out and you're playing with it right now. What is the difference between the two? Yeah, it's actually GPT three for now. And we are fascinated by what GPT four will be. Um, uh, so a little background on the technology it's, uh, open AI had this thesis that if they can train a large enough model and a large enough algorithm, it will become smart. Um, and so they launched something called GPT-2 about a year and a half ago now, maybe even almost two years ago now. And it was pretty impressive. Um, but 
maybe one in a hundred were really mind blowing results. And then maybe like one in 20 was like passive. The rest were complete crap. So Paul actually spent a lot of time with GPT-2 really trying to uh, explore the capabilities. And that means wading through a lot of, you know, bad content uh, to look and find the gems. GPT-3 is a model that's just a hundred times bigger than GPT-2. And it's probably one of the largest models that have, has been commercialized to date. Um, and when OpenAI released it, uh, we saw immediately, it was like, wow, maybe like three in 10 were like really good results. Five out of 10 were publicly passive. Um, one in 10, maybe one in 20 were like mind blowingly good. Um, and we knew immediately that was much more commercially viable because, you know, with one or two clicks, you get really, really good results. Um, the way we see GPT-3, um, and giving a little bit of background there is it's a model where they just try to predict the next word. So where it's not technically a word, but we'll say it's the word here. So if you have like my name, like the next word has a very high probability to be is, um, and so they might try to predict that. Um, but there's also a little bit of randomness thrown in. So there are other words that could go after hi, my name. And then, you know, it may choose one of those other ones on separate runs. Um, but what this results in is everyone is trying to set up the context for it to finish run. And so it looks very much like Harry Potter stuff. The better you can set up the context, the better you can, uh, uh, prepare the AI to complete what you need it to complete, the better the results. And so even though it's a lot of companies are being built on GPT-3, the way you implement it actually has very drastic differences and the quality changes drastically as well. Got it. So is that kind of your competitive edge, bringing a creativity model to it, where you can take this open API that they're providing, but the way you're reverting it to create is a little bit different than what competitors might be doing. Or is what's your competitive edge? Yeah, that's probably one of the strong ones. And I think our competitive edge comes down to our mission and vision. Uh, it's our North star metric. And while it's not very powerful today has a moat, um, I think it'll look very different five, 10 years down the line. Um, yeah, I think the way we approach the market, uh, matters a lot. Uh, it, it really tells you which tool to build first, which ones to prioritize. And it also builds out a brand of process. Got it. So are you limited right now to TP? Uh, I got to get the acronym right, right now. Now. with GPT-3, or are you kind of like really anxious to get the GPT-4 in your hands? Are you, are, are you maxed out at what it can do right now? Or are you able to take a little bit further or where do you stand right now with, with the technology? Yeah, GPT-3 is already really, really powerful. And I think we've barely scratched the surface. Um, when it first launched, people were showing off all kinds of cool demos, like having it write code, um, having it create designs. <laughs> um, of course, you know, the, the way you implement it is very different than how we're implementing it, where we write words, <laughs> uh, but it, it is just as impressive for those tasks. Um, and as a result, I think that there is a whole world of possibility that we haven't even tapped into. All of our tools are basically the most simple building blocks, uh, for today. Uh, but down the line in the future, I think there's going to be a lot of really, really cool things you could do with it, um, that are much more advanced, that would be much more helpful to users as well. Um, GPT-4, if and when they launch it, I can only imagine how much better it will be. Um, if it's anything like the jump between GPT-2 and GPT-3, it's going to be mind blowing. <laughs> um, but it's already pretty hard to see how much better it can get than GPT-3. Um, one thing that is on the plate though, and this is a little tangential is OpenAI released a blog post about a DALI, which is a image generation, um, API that hasn't been released yet, but effectively you'll be able to describe an image and then the AI algorithm will draw it. Oh, that's great. So do you, do you 
is there like a list that you've created internally of like all these ideas that you could create with it? Because really the, the sky's the limit in terms of creativity. I could only think of a, you know, five or six use case applications. And then I get inside your application and there's uh 30. And do you have another hundred that you've put on a Google doc somewhere or secured in a safe? Um, I, I don't expect you to share those with me, but, uh, I'm just curious as to where the ideas stem from, or are you doing some, um, highly classified brainstorming somewhere or, or what, what are your, what are your ideas behind that? Yeah. Our tools usually fall into two categories. One is business. So it's like anything that requires you to write something in business, like it could be used for that. Um, and so we dog food our product a lot. <laughs> if we need to write a tweet, if we need to, you know, do anything, we will like test it out and Hey, could GPT-3 do this? Recently, um, we were looking at job descriptions and it's like, oh, we need to create a tool for that. So that got added to the list. It's not ready yet, but added to the list. Um, more recently, uh, the other side of tools that we have uh, are more for fun. Uh, more for personal utility where it's like, you know, stuff that's just painful to write. Um, then it's less, you know, associated with marketing or SEO or anything along those lines. So for example, for students, uh, writing your cover letter, like I remember when I was a student, I had no idea where you can start. Um, and, but now we have a tool. So if I were a college student today, I would just type in the job that I want or the company that I'm looking for, click a button and, and I have a great starting point, uh, for a really, really solid cover letter. Um, uh, one other fun tool that we launched recently was, uh, for Valentine's day. Um, we had this thing called Valentine's day.ai where we would help you write Valentine's day cards. We believe that people really want to express their love, but sometimes struggle to find the words for it. And when they struggle to find the words for it, you know, it just comes out cheesy and it just doesn't feel right. Uh, with AI, you can actually help brainstorm the different words and you input like inside jokes or, you know, more contextual stuff about your specific relationship and get back words that you could use, uh, for your own talent. The way we see uh, copy AI right now is much more like an assistant that helps you brainstorm. You take bits and pieces from all the different generations it has, and then you put it together and that final product is your own. And you may have what well, you wrote it <laughs> uh, ai just right. helped you brains different ways but you're the one who edited it and figured out this is exactly what i'm trying to express yep i i, I hear that exactly it uh, it reminds me of a experience i had in the early in the late 90s when i was in an english class and i literally that's when the internet and more content was coming online and i literally was re reading the great gatsby and I copy and pasted a section and I put it into my report and the teacher kept up bringing up plagiarism and I didn't know what she was talking about. And then eventually I got a little slap on the wrist and, uh, my grade dropped a little bit because I had plagiarized, not really thinking anything of it, but something like this, you put that paragraph into copy.ai and it's going to regurgitate a different way of saying it. Right. Um, yeah. not to say that. We should go off and teach our kids this, but I think it allows them to get more creative in coming up with verbs and adverbs and nouns that would allow them to express what they're trying to say uh, more effectively. Um, they still have to make completed sentences and craft it, you know, make it personal. And I don't think AI will ever get to a point in some industries it will like manufacturing and that sort of stuff, but with the creative realm, I don't think it's going to replace the copywriter. It's just going to empower them just like these other tools, other manufacturing tools. So with that, are you, are you seeing a, a big organization here with copy.ai? I see that you're hiring. Um, what are those positions and where do you see a copy dot AI going in the, in the, you know, six months, year, two years? Yeah. You touched on a really, really strong point there, which is, um, we are deeply, deeply, uh, passionate about using AI to empower people. 
not replaced. As a matter of fact, one of our founding mission statements when we uh, first left our jobs uh, was there was a narrative out there where it says AI is going to take over, take our jobs. And if that is true, there's a second narrative where it will, AI will make it easier to start companies. So we are on a mission to help shift people from losing their jobs to, oh no, now I am part of being that company that gets benefit from the AI. Uh, and that it's a very subtle thing, but I think it's really, really important. Um, and so everything we do has been around, how do we empower humans? We don't do auto, we do suggestions. We really, really, we think that ultimately the AI is great at generation, but it's down to the human to curate and bring it back to exactly what you want to express. Um, that being said, uh, our long-term vision is to create creative tools that can help an entrepreneur start business. Um, we believe that uh, very deeply in the passion economy. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's basically, you will be able to make a living focused on your passion. Sure. Uh, content creators are probably the early signs, but they're living in the future and it's because you can make content about anything. So they're, you know, they're already, it's a very meta, uh, but they're already doing it. You know, it's like, oh, I am passionate about train. So I make a lot of videos about different trains. I get a lot of views. I can run ads on it and there you go. I have a living. Um, so we, we really do believe in this. And, uh, one of the hardest parts though, of starting a business is getting all of the words, right? Getting the message, right? Connecting with the customer. Um, and so our tooling wants, to, we want to create these creative tools that help get there. One other point that you touched upon is we're not going to replace copywriters. As a matter of fact, copywriters will actually be empowered in a, in a much more powerful way and everyone else. And the reason for that is the point of the before where every single word you use to input into the AI matters. And a good copywriter will have better words to input, which means that the AI will understand your intentions in a much better way. So if you use a word like, you know, I, I like, you know, cheese or something like that. Uh, and then you change it to like, I like this specific type of cheats, you know, it, 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 it really changes the output. Um, and the better you are with words, the better you are with telling and describing at least what you're looking for, uh, the better the results. So co good copywriters, a good storytellers will find this a super tool. Yeah, that's what we see it as well. Uh, internally, we are. Um, not just our copywriters are creating content for our clients, but we're actually paying them to create content for us internally, right? So we practice what we preach in terms of we, we're curating a whole bunch of content because when people type in those long tail keywords, we want them to find us. In order to do that, we need to rank high on Google and that you bring up a good, uh, interesting topic that we could probably talk an hour about, but essentially this, this, the passion, uh, I guess, uh, influence of today, uh, you know, people are like, I want to do what I'm passionate about. They have the ability to take content that's already been created, put it into this tool, whether they have to do several copy and paste to generate it, but they can spend like a half an hour a day doing a blog post that was curated, you know, 10 years ago. And they can repurpose it as their own because they changed it up and up where it's not plagiarism, where they can do that. And when they start doing that, if they're consistent with it and they put in the keywords that they're looking for to be ranked for, they can rise in the Google rankings, um, with the ability to get to those people that are interested in that specific niche. So I think the empowerment that we're allowing people that even aren't copywriters that they will have the ability to say, I'm passionate about X, Y, Z, and this is a tool over here that I have to spend what $40 a month, $50 a month. I'm not, you might raise the price to hundred dollars a month. I'm not sure, but essentially what you want them to do is say here, here's another tool in your tool belt that allows you to start a business. Not just that you're not a copywriter, take copy that's over on this site and bring it to this site. So 
are you seeing yourself using copy.ai as you expand the options, you know, the, the, the passionate person say there's a hundred different niches, are they going to be able to go in there and say, um, I want to do it for this specific niche or it's already to that point, or, you know, when you get so many options, are you going after this small group over here, or you go after a huge group over here, you see yourself branching out into different, you know, making an umbrella over copy.ai. Where do you see it going? That's a great question. And we are still just debating it internally. Um, there's just so many ways to go. <laughs> um, but what is our North star is helping empower more and more entrepreneurs. So that we definitely will want to launch more tools for beginner entrepreneurs to really be able to ramp up quickly. Um, and it's very much like Shopify's arm the rebels in a motto where it's, we are trying to arm the rebels. Um, you know, that AI taking the jobs thing. It's like, we do think that's going to potentially happen. Uh, but you know, we're going to arm the rebels. So not only are they going to like, not, they're not going to get the place. No employees, we're going to empower employees to quit their jobs <laughs> first and then start these other things. The result's going to be the same, but the, uh, employee, uh, it, the everyday person is going to be far better off. Um, on your other point, um, about the different niches and whatnot, um, one of our favorite tools is actually change tone and we need to rename it. It's, it's a horrible name for the, the, the tool, but basically you can type in like, you know, a product description or something from a different, you know, competitor website. And then choose the tone that you want, click the button and get the same thing rewritten in a different tone. So for example, if you have a candle brand and you want to have this more playful, witty sort of, you know, feel to it, you can literally take a competitor's, you know, candle description, you know, and then put it through and then click witty, press the button and get back wittier candle descriptions that will have a lot more personality and you can build an entire plan around, around being like a witty candle brand. Um, and you know, you can already imagine what that would look like. Um, and you can do this across everything. Uh, and so as long as you can find something that you're passionate about and you're willing to spend the time to, you know, really make it happen, really define the brand, the voice, you know, what you really want from it, you can start a business today, um, in less time than ever. As a matter of fact, you could probably start that business within a day. <laughs> You know, get it up and running on Shopify, find the manufacturer that's going to drop ship these candles, for example, you know, and then you can probably launch it by the end of the day. Um, before it might've taken a lot more time because it would take a lot of time to write the copy to really define the brand, but these days it's a lot easier. Um, and that's one of the big motivating factors. Uh, Paul and I think about this a lot. Um, if every single one of your business ideas has a 10% chance of success. How many times do you have to do it before overall, all of your projects has like a, at least one of them has like a 95%. And the answer right now is 30. Uh, you have to do it 30 times and you'll have over a 95% chance of one of them succeeding. What we want to do is not only decrease the number of times, but also we want to make it easier to do more projects, but we also want to improve the potential chances. So we can push that up, you know, to 20%, you know, the number of tries to find a successful business actually drops significantly. Um, and we believe that this will happen across everyone. You know, if you talk to any entrepreneur, they've had multiple, multiple failures. Me, myself, personally, <laughs> I made a TikTok about it. I have like 10 failures underneath my belt. Um, and you know, this one just seems like an overnight success, but it was many, many years. Yeah. You make a good point. I think that, uh, there's various reasons why, it, why a business would fail, um, the execution, but this essentially, um, is giving them a tool to say, Hey, we'll take care of you over here. Yeah. You got to do the marketing aspect. You got to pay for ads. You got to curate content and you got to take it to your audience. But this is just another way that we're empowering the marketplace to, to bring it to the percentages that you're talking about. It, if they have one thing fixed on their plate of to-dos, then they'll be able to 
you know, take a breather and say, oh, I can focus my energy or my time on this over here. But if, if they're not able to grasp, uh, writing or, or able to create creative writing that penetrates or excites their audience, then they're really, they're not going to get anywhere, right? They can have a website with a nice picture, but if it's not explaining it properly, then they're not going anywhere. So it really, I think it levels the playing field. Like you said before, I think copywriters, it's not going to replace them, but it's going to make copywriters out of non-copywriters as well. Um, exactly. The good copywriters, you know, and the experienced ones are probably the best storytellers on the planet. Um, and that is a skill that just won't be easily replaced. They'll have a very good sense of how do you tell this story? How do you make it exude through all of the websites? So if I were starting a company today and we did, um, I would use copy AI to potentially run through the first version, right? Get some traction and validate the problem. If we can validate it, then the next step is to probably bring on someone who's a really good storyteller, some more experienced copywriter to really help refine story and make it feel and flow a lot better. Uh, that being said, you know, these days there's so much content that needs to happen. You don't need a full-time copywriter on every single Instagram post. Yet you do want the Instagram post to have that quality. So copy AI, uh, it can fill in that gap. Um, so there's just, I think there's going to be so much more that needs to be written. Uh, there's probably not enough copywriters out there. All right. So I'm just curious in respect to the creative element and, and not crossing any boundaries. So if I were to take some content from, um, a website that is written like a sales page and it has a story, it has a hook and I regurgitate that into copy.ai, is it going to change it enough that would allow the person or is it because that story or that it's written a specific way that you can't repurpose it? with copy.ai and you don't want to deal with the legalities there is, or I don't know, have you looked into that or what that looks like? Not yet. We are focused very much in shorter form, like maximum 400 characters or so. Um, and, and the reason is, uh, when you start looking at full landing pages and rewriting a entire landing page, it does get pretty complicated. Um, but what I can tell you though, is most landing pages do tell a story in a pretty similar way. There's like a lot of those, you know, very common copywriting formulas, like pain, agitate, solution, ADA, whatnot. Um, and we can help you brainstorm those, which so it's like, if you saw a sales page, it's like, wow, they did pain, agitate, solution really, really well for this product. Can I do that for my product? You can run it through copy AI, get it back. And you could find other pain points or other ways to cite them. Um, one of the early uh, users we had was so excited because they've been thinking about this topic for 20 years. Uh, it wasn't about AI or anything. He was thinking about the topic for 20 years. He ran it through Copy AI and it gave him four or five new angles that he hasn't even considered before. And he's like, wow, like I've been focusing so much on trying to understand this topic, yet with one click of a button in 10 seconds, I was able to get new ideas. And that just blew his mind. And that was what we think the power of this AI can be. It's a really, really good at lateral thinking. It's really, really good at pattern recognition. It's really, really good at trying to find, you know, similar things. And it also has a huge knowledge base. Um, I should have explained earlier, but this model is trained on about 10% of the internet as of October, 2019. So it knows a lot of context. and as a matter of fact, one of my uh, favorite tools is uh, startup ideas, where you can go in there, type in two completely unrelated topics, and it will try to create business ideas for you out of these, out of the interesting topics. But there was once where I did like, you know, dinosaurs, you know, and then like amusement parks and then like, you know, something, and it was giving me an incredible, like VR dinosaur experience, you know, park or like, you know. And, and it was mind blowing. Um, and so we believe with these tools, and if you put in your passions, you will find something that you that intersect all of your passion. You would be the right person to pursue this idea just because this is who you are, what you believe in and what you're really, really passionate. 
Well, that's great, Chris. I appreciate your time today. I just, I think that's a good stopping point for us because I want the, our audience to understand your tool, its capabilities in the trajectory of, in which it's going in the future. So please, um, what, what's a good way that our audience and your audience can reach out to you? If they can reach out to you personally, great. If you just want them to go to the site, but how, how can we get in contact with you? Yeah, we live and breathe on Twitter. Um, I highly suggest following my co-founder and I. His Twitter is twitter.com slash Paul Yakubian. And my Twitter is twitter.com uh, slash Chris underbar underbar LU. There's two underbars in there. Um, Paul actually made a joke the other day that our Twitter is our Slack channel. And it, <laughs> it feels like that many times. Well, it sounds like it's your revenue channel as well, especially with the posts and the, what the traction you've been able to get from it. So congratulations, you've grown significantly. How many users do you have right now that are paying, if you don't mind? Yeah, we have about a thousand two hundred now. Um, it might be a little higher than that. It grows a little bit every day and we're very, very fortunate. Um, but we're really excited. Every single user, you know, we, to us represents, you know, uh, entrepreneur or something with yeah. village right to starve or run their own business. And these are the people that we want to support. Wonderful. Well, thanks for your time once again, Chris, and I uh, appreciate it. And we'll, we'll see you continue to grow and we'll keep following you. So. Perfect. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And, uh, look forward to it. All right. Take care. Thanks. Have a good one.